Let us begin. Good evening and good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Dr. Thomas McManus, and I am Acting Director of the International State Crime Initiative. Um, I am delighted um, to be chairing tonight's event. It's a really great honour to welcome uh, Professor Christian Laslett, uh, Chris from the University of Ulster, uh, for tonight's talk, Looting the North, Looting the South, Investigating Transnational Corruption. Um, the format of the event is going to be about 40 minutes, uh, 45 minutes of me asking Chris qu questions directly, and then we're going to open it up to the rest of the audience to, um, to uh, a question and answer session. So we'll have a good discussions and uh, Q&A at the end, and we'll have plenty of time for that. Um, I just want to tell you a bit about Chris first. Um, he's the head of School of Applied Social and Policy Sciences at the University of Ulster, uh, and he also sits on the executive board of ISCI, um, and along with that is an editor of Chief of State Crime Journal um, and an editor of the State Crime Testimony Project. Um, Professor Laslett has been researching state corporate power um, and communities of resistance that emerge in oppositions to the, those crimes uh, for many years now. Um, he has started his uh, fieldwork, I suppose, into the, into the area uh, on the extractive industries and did a landmark study uh, on the Bougainville conflict. Um, and looks at corruption, land grabbing, and forced evictions. Um, he has published a lot on state crime, state corporate crime, um, and particularly in the theoretical side of things. Um, and he has two books out at the moment, State Crime on the Margins of Empire and Uncovering the Crimes of Urbanization, Researching Corruption, Violence, and Urban Conflict. Um, and thank you so much, Chris, for joining us uh, for this talk. Um, I'm Really looking forward to getting into the detail of the reports, especially um, I'm hoping we get to touch on uh, A Dance with the Cobra, but also uh, the more recent report, Conflicts of Interest and Transparency uh, in Mirzi Yoyev's uh, Uzbekistan. Um, so I will begin, uh, we'll kick off with um, possibly an easier question. Can you tell us something about what grand corruption is, Chris? And also tell us a bit about why you decided to look at this question of grand corruption. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, um, you know, well, firstly, thanks, Tom, for the wonderful introduction. And thanks to, to ISKI for hosting um, these great um, webinars. And it's fantastic to, in one way, we have these kind of, you know, always looking at the silver linings of our last 12 months. And I think opening up the world of digital connection um, has been brilliant. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, grand corruption. I mean, I think, um, you know, you know, in, I guess firstly, maybe starting at the second part of the question, which is, you know, why, um, you know, looking at it, because I think, you know, corruption, you know, most people have a broad sense of what it means, it, it, you know, um, and grand is obviously at the larger scale. And I think what's interesting is that it's, it's obviously something that's, that as an issue has certainly, um, um, escalated in 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 its in the attention being given to it on the world stage, but probably most critically by pretty orthodox forces. So it's something that sort of most governments ostensibly sign up to as being an important issue they want to tackle. Um, you know, you do have quite significant amounts of of funding and attention being put into tackling grand corruption and kleptocracy and things of that nature. Um, but but I think what's kind of maybe slightly unusual about grand corruption is that it's sort of, you know, a, a significant impetus for, for this kind of attention has come from quite conventional, almost neoliberal sort of quarters, you know, I mean, you know, Transparency International being sort of set up, he was by former IMF people and, and World Bank types and, and, you know, the World Bank's been big on this. So it's not something that's kind of, you know, been an issue that has been necessarily amplified by, um, you know, more radical sectors of society, um, though, of course, you know, it is something I've got onto that in a second, but it's something that's really moved on to the, the, the sort of um, centre stage of policy and law, often because it's the more orthodox sort of 
seg sections of national and international society that have taken interest into it. And I think the reason I kind of point to that is because a lot of, if you look at a lot of the the, the policy literature around that, that comes from that perspective, you know, it's the idea that, that sort of global capitalism is broadly this thing that would work pretty well at lifting up poverty and managing all the sort of different interests in society. But there's sort of these malevolent corrupting forces that come in and prevent sort of that, you know, that sort of inhibit capitalism from floating all boats. And, and so, and the argument is, there's, so there's this kind of exterior uh, malevolent force of corruption that pervades particularly prolifically in a lot of uh, areas that are experiencing underdevelopment. And, and were it not for these forces, capitalism would have done a great job in sort of, in sort of bringing about all the benefits that, that, that obviously more orthodox financial actors believe that it can bring to all parts of the world. Um, and so in that sense, you know, a lot of interest has come to corruption and grand corruption from this kind of almost this moral kind of moralistic perspective that it's it's something that's malevolent that's come in and really corrupted the, the ability of capitalism to really um, uh, uh, be able to, to deliver the benefits to all people across the globe, which it otherwise would have done. And I obviously don't come from that perspective. My interest in grand corruption comes from a radical political economy perspective, um, wherein, you know, to me, um, theft is not a sort of particularly shocking thing because that to me is sort of intrinsically what capitalism is kind of built on, you know, the transfer, the transference of, I mean, in the initial, in its initial kind of inception, you know, you kind of have that period of primitive accumulation where, you know, um, assets were, were, were seized. Um, from rural communities, people were, were, were sort of jettisoned into industrial centres. But then, um, you know, the whole premise of capitalism and explaining how you can have absolute polarised uh, wealth is that there's clearly a distribution of, of value from the people who create it to those who have different forms of power. So why would you look at, when, why would you look at corruption as theft when, it's, when, when the whole system is built on a kind of transference of wealth? And I guess it's, you know, what began to interest me was that, you know, despite that backdrop of being someone who's sort of rooted in, in, in um, you know, uh, that, that political economic tradition, you began to see that, like, you know, particularly working somewhere like Papua New Guinea, that the very dynamics that are at the heart of capitalism lead to the polarization of power. And when you have power accumulating in smaller number of hands who are often in quite ancestral relationships with each other boy oh boy doesn't it create a whole opportunity structure for them to think well why don't we um you know find other ways of, in of augmenting our return you know because if you've got the power why not do it and that's where i think so i kind of approach corruption from that sort of radical political economic perspective where i'm i kind of visualize a global economy as you know, uh, through that kind of uh, model of, you know, you have monetary capital that goes into, um, into productive capital, which is your kind of means of production and your labor power that produces a whole, you know, whole myriad of, of commodities across the world. Um, that then is, is distributed to markets through commercial capital, it's consumed. And then of course, um, you kind of have revenue forms like, you know, wages, uh, profit at enterprise, commercial profits, um, interest, uh, rents, and then and then on top of that, where well, you have all those revenues, and of course taxation, um, and then you have those revenues that are then often now more and more being invested into um, security markets where they're not actually producing any value, they're just kind of competing for existing value. And then I, you know, I also come from that from a, so obviously that's one part of it. And the other part is, for me, the state is a critical part of every part of that process as value goes through all those different stages and circulates and accumulates. Um, the state is always there shaping and, and, and propelling it and regulating it and making it possible for all those steps to take place. And so I was always interested then how at each moment in that process, that power could be gained in ways that allow particular actors to, to kind of inflate their return, you know? Um, and so in somewhere like Papua New Guinea, you know, I was always looking at, um, you know, how 
there are, you know, whatever it might be, for example, um, you know, if you want to get access to, to forestry resources, you want to get access to mineral resources. I mean, obviously the state is a, is a, is a gatekeeper for that. And if you can get access to without paying any rent, for any monopoly rents because Papua New Guinea happens to be sitting on huge supplies of oil gas. Um, great, you know, why wouldn't you do it? You game it, you go, you don't have to pay any rent to the to the the, the state that happens to be the, the fortunate owner of that of that very rare resource. So you can escape paying monopoly rents. Um, you know, on the on the on the flip side, um, if you're in somewhere like Uzbekistan, where I do a lot of work, um, you know, competition is not great for capitalism. You know, even though I talk, you know, if you're an individual capital, you don't like you don't like competition because it it it, it creates disciplinary pressures on you. So in somewhere like in Uzbekistan, markets there are carefully curated. So anointed ones are allowed to, uh, you know, basically control certain markets, and therefore they're able to gouge the consumer, whoever that might be. So you know, what really interested me was how on top of the conventional forms of exploitation that are part of capitalism, there is also the potential to create super exploitation or through the corrupt gaming of state and, and, and corporate power. Um, and I was really interested in sort of mapping all the ways that can happen. Um, and, and that's kind of, um, and that's where I, I sort of guess when you come back to that question of, what, of how do I define um, grand corruption? And that's a really tricky question. And I, actually, I probably won't go into it because I could go for another 10 minutes, 20 minutes on that because it raises mm -hmm. all sorts of complex questions. But I suppose for me, you know, I don't, um, you know, there. Are, I don't need to repeat like those Transparency International, so, you know, the, the use of public office or abuse of public office for private gain or the abuse of trusted power for private gain and grand usually adds the implication that's at a very large scale of, of, of my, I mean, and those are all, they're not, they're not, they're, they're definitions, they're useful in ways and they help certain things. But for me, it's often just, it's about sort of, um, you know, understanding how different about how how power is gained in manipulative ways to try and 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 engorge um, the kind of wealth or political power people are able to extract from the system and and that's kind of the working rule I use and and and, and I don't try and close down what I might consider as corruption by having a particularly limited definition um, so yeah um so, so you raise a, a, a couple of examples there, and I know from your more recent work that you do a lot of focusing on the tracing of networks and schemes um, that use to transfer wealth between corrupt actors or, or two corrupt actors. Um, can you give a couple of examples of, of how, of, of schemes and how that works, how that, 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 that tracing those networks helps us understand um, yeah, these mechanisms, these whole, these these processes. Yeah, and I mean, I think, and I think it's interesting because you know, and I begin almost from the perspective of I don't even like to think of them as as corrupt actors. I think every actor, every actor at the big end of town, so to speak, without being too pejorative and generalistic, are involved in corruption. Because when you have power, there's just so many ways you can use it to game the system to increase your your return. So so it's not like we can easily say here are some corrupt actors and here are the the non-corrupt actors, which really goes back to the kind of foundations of kind of, you know, Sutherland on white collar crime, where he said basically every big corporation is a criminal, um, you know, and that I think is true sort of when it comes to corruption. Um, but yeah, like I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, you mentioned it before. Um, one of the sort of most um, detailed, um, you know, case studies I I've conducted was on the daughter um, or eldest daughter of the Uzbekistan's first president, so first post-Soviet pre uh, president, who was in power from 1991 until his death in 2016. Um, and so Uzbekistan is, is, is a, is a um, authoritarian regime, um, which, you know, is a, is a, involves a, a very tightly controlled capitalist market system. Um, and, and, um, and, and, and a huge amount of power pools around the president, um, their family, and the head of security services, the internal security services. And usually it depends, um, and usually on a several other major uh, players from politics and from the economy. So oligarchs 
and 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 senior ministers who are also oligarchs as well you know um and so you know and it was really interesting i think um tracing so the the, the eldest daughters is of the president's gunara karamova um and and it was really interesting i suppose you said doing that tracing because it, it helped you learn a lot about the um how capitalism and cor corruption come together to augment returns to people like Karamova, how they, the forms of power they use. Um, and so there were big theoretical questions you could better answer if you had really granular data. And so, you know, I'll give you an example of what you can learn by just taking you through that kind of Karamova example. So, um, so she, uh, daughter of the president, um, you know, 1991, she's very young. Um, she's just graduated from university. Um, she uh, sort of has a fairly, um, you know, a fairly standard life for a, mem a, a child of the elite. You know, she meets her soon, her soon to be husband at, at her, I think her 19th or 20th birthday party. He's a, a very kind of um, uh, uh, Mansur Maksudi, who's from a very uh, wealthy Afghan American family, but um, uh, of Uzbek ethnicity. And they fall in love, they get married, um, and Mansur and his um, brother um, end up um, having a very profitable business in Uzbekistan, and that's through being the joint venture partners for Coca-Cola. Um, so Coca-Cola, you know, Uzbekistan's opening up. So, you know, probably one of the most popular things when you're opening up following the Soviet period is to bring in all those kind of forbidden, you know, Western brands. You can make quite a lot of money. And so um, Coca-Cola enters in um, and, um, you know, and everything's humming along well. Um, they're living in, um, uh, in, in New Jersey, in America, because uh, they've moved there. They've got, they end up having two young children. And, um, you know, Gunara seems to, she gets a master's. I think she goes on, does a PhD and goes to Harvard, you know, and, and, and they settle in a very nice um, house in, in a very upmarket Jersey suburb and everything's so, and, and, you know, it, it, it's a fairly sedate upper middle-class life or whatever you want to call it. Probably not upper middle-class. They probably have a net worth at this stage about 80 million, um, but that's mainly through Coca-Cola and she owns nightclubs, restaurants, things like that, but nothing that would really put you on the kleptocrat scale yet. And then what was interesting was she had this, um, uh, 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 in July of 2001, um, her and her husband have quite a, 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 a nasty argument and um, he gets kicked out of the house by her security detail. Um, the next day she takes her children to um, Uzbekistan, flees the country, takes her children to Uzbekistan um, and immediately begins a, a campaign of persecution um, against um, Coca-Cola, um, the, Coca the, the Coca-Cola of Uzbekistan. So, you know, she's immediately going out there to basically um, uh, to, to expropriate um, her husband's family from, from their business um, holdings. And, what's, and that's where the really interesting story begins to take place because their joint venture partner is Coca-Cola and they're sitting in Atlanta and they're going, Oh dear, our joint venture partner, our golden joint venture partner, who's married to the daughter of uh, those bands, is now the um, ex-husband of a very aggrieved um, daughter of, uh, and what are we going to do? Um, so what do they do? They, they go and um, get a very um, uh, uh, high price uh, Washington DC lobbying firm. Um, and they, they pull together a team to go to Uzbekistan and try and and secure Coke's future. Um, and, and they do that by getting Susan Eisenhower, who is the granddaughter of Dwight Eisenhower, um, and her husband, who is a former advisor to Gorbachev. So you have this kind of, you know, super elite, you know, well-connected. They go as a husband and wife team to see if they can kind of try and reach out. Um, and Coke's really clear, like they're going, we've got a, like, Mansudi, uh, the Maksudi family are toxic. Let's get away from them. And let's find how we can keep uh, uh, keep in Uzbekistan. And as one memo said, keep Pepsi out. So they've got this. So they want to keep a monopoly because, um, um, you know, they, that's how they can um, make a lot of um, money. Um, and, and, and obviously, if you don't have competition from your main rival, um, you know, you've, you've got 
the whole market to yourself. Um, so again, ordinary capitalist dynamics, driving what we'll soon to see is a, an incentive for perhaps questionable conduct. Um, and, and that is they soon find out through their very, um, you know, highly skilled consultants that um, the person who's going to decide whether Co uh, Coke's future is Gunnar Karamova. And, and at first they kind of use code language. They, the, uh, they, uh, they use words like G, you know, G and, or they refer to her as, as um, the family um, in, in internal memos. Um, and, uh, but they know that they have to um, find an arrangement that will be um, to her satisfaction. And uh, they end up um, now according to her um, uh, sort of my senior manager at the time, who subsequently fled to the United States. Um, he met with um, a, a Coca-Cola executive in Tashkent, and they kind of hatched a deal where she would take over as Coke's um, joint venture partner. Um, and and that, that in the meantime, they would buy from her um, uh, uh, concentrate for their Coca-Cola. So she would supply them at marked up prices. So in other words, the implication from that being that they were basically paying her a fee on top of the ordinary market price um, uh, that, that would, um, you know, um, uh, that would buy her favor. Um, and, and she sets up a UAE company to facilitate this arrangement. Um, where she's the owner of it, um, but you can't find that out because it's the UAE and that's why you go there to incorporate. Um, and then um, all the transactions are through Citibank. Um, so Citibank, so they start, so she starts buying, providing concentrate and, um, you know, and Coca-Cola starts paying her three, 400,000 uh, bucks every time they get a concentrate shipment. Um, and so then you, you begin to see um, the model that, that's starting to emerge. Um, where she's used kind of, um, you know, these offshore companies, offshore bank accounts. Um, and then she ends up um, using another offshore company to get the, 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 the stake in the other, the 55% stake in Coca-Cola, which she buys at uh, something like a 80% discount. Um, and obviously, you know, you don't know how she got that money to buy that because that, even still that's 14 million US dollars. But obviously she's getting all these quite gratuitous payments through other means. So it's a kind of almost, if you will, a, a way of raising capital. Um, you raise capital through using your control over market access. And then you use that capital you raise to invest in acquiring new holdings. And you can acquire those new holdings at a discount because you, you also have the power of the presidential office. Um, and so, so it became really interesting to see how she was beginning to grow an empire, a business empire, and how ordinary market economics and, and then corrupt gaming of that same um, process was allowing her to grow and grow. And, and she, and she was buying into other, she was buying state enterprises and, and paying, buying them for a, a, you know, a, 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 a discount um, then she, she also uh, was acting as a gatekeeper for the telecommunications industry. And, and, and in that respect, you had um, a number of major telecommunications companies who were going, boy, oh boy, Uzbekistan really doesn't have anyone with mobile phones. Um, it's 2002, 2003, everyone's getting mobile phones. Um, we really want access to the market. And she was known, uh, so you had Telia in Sweden, you had, um, Vimplecom, which was based in Netherlands, and you had Russia's MTS, and they all wanted access. And there was a very simple route to access. You had to go through Gunara. Um, and in order to do that, and you had to pay a bribe. Um, and the way you paid a bribe was you bought um, uh, one of her companies at a inflated price. Um, and, and, you know, so that's, that's how you paid the first bribe to get market access. Um, and, you know, you see from the memos, internal memos within these telecommunication companies that they were, you know, going, well, this is pretty suspicious and dodgy looking, um, you know, why would we pay 60 million US dollars for like a pretty valueless company? And management would sort of say, because this is, this is a political reality, you need, if you don't have, if you don't buy political support in Uzbekistan, you only have enemies. Um, and if you have enemies, you've got no chance of prospering here. And so it seems like um, that was enough to allow the audited, the auditing bodies in these organizations to, to, to sort of go back in their, in their cage and, and, and allow these deals to be hatched. And then she would, um, 
go once once they were in of course um she could shake them down at, at intermittent um stages to get more money when 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 uh, she wanted and and that would be you could just shut down their, their operations and then say uh, and then they would enter in consult consultancy contracts with her where they would pay one of her offshore companies um i think in one case they paid an offshore company called tackleant limited registered in gibraltar um so a british overseas territory they paid at 30 million dollars um in order to produce expert technical report which was all cut and paste from wikipedia um and then delivered and then they got 30 million uh uh dollars for that and then um obviously for the telecommunications companies because they were basically able to control a market amongst a big market you know 30 million people amongst a small number of players they were obviously uh, extracting huge amounts of profits over and above if they were in a fully competitive open market so it was worth um it was worthwhile for them to pay um that 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 gate fee for having that very special privilege and so they could keep paying this money up to her then she was using that to buy um um you know productive capital, cement factories, um, you know, uh, medical facilities, whatever you name it, and was really branching out using this money to, to, to start a really vibrant big business empire worth many billions of dollars by the time um, it all comes crashing down. And then she's using a whole, the whole offshore um, zone to sort of ma manage the money. Um, so you have, um, you know, things like, uh, Originally, she banked with Citibank. They started to decide those smooth payments of four hundred thousand dollars coming in from Coca Cola to a company owned by the president's daughter were a bit sus. So she decided to move her business to Standard and Charter Bank, um, which is a British bank um, implicated in quite a lot of skullduggery um, over the years, and and they've had to sort of to sign deferred prosecution agreements, but not in the case of Karamova. There's never been any sort of um, um, substantiation that they did anything necessarily wrong at least by authorities um then she moved her business to lombard odier a private bank in um in switzerland who managed her business so she had access to 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 private banks uh, around the world and she was using all the offshore facilities um that you know in gibraltar bvis um hong kong uh, UAE, and then was putting the money into productive enterprise in Uzbekistan, but was also investing a lot into real estate in France, uh, the UK. And also when you're in a precarious environment like Uzbekistan, it's also good to have a, a, a bucket load of things like jewelry and things like that, because if things go bad, you can always carry, put jewelry in a bag and, and, and end up somewhere far, far away with, you know, millions of dollars you can then um, sell, you know, turn to liquid cash. Um, so, you know, for me, you know, as, a, as, a, as an example, by, you know, going into that case study in such intimate detail, you began to understand this was not um, as kind of corruption is presented, like some, um, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a, a sort of... Um, malevolent outside exterior force this was everyday business standard capitalist enterprise it's just that in, in built within those dynamics uh and particularly we're, we're a whole way, a host of ways to augment your return if you had the, the 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 power and the connections to do it um and and you know so that to me was was you know and then you know that's why looking at it in such intricate detail is really important just just from the the example alone that you that you give there the the, the one kind of small one person in, in one situation the sheer detail the sheer number of links across jurisdictions and and through organizations that need to be established and and we're talking about a world where um people might not want you to make those links and, and those links may not be as easy to find uh, due to access or, or lack of transparency and the rest so so how do you how do you do granular level work like that what is the what kind of methods do you need to employ to get down yeah. to that level of detail and to be able to process the huge amounts that there are and able to 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 expose what's going on yeah, well, I mean, I th and I think, you know, um, you're right. I mean, just that first part of the, the question, you know, about, you know, the extraordinary, you know, and one thing I should have said that I didn't maybe say was underneath Karamova was this, this organization called The Office. So 
and she had this entire like you know office of people who were working day and night on all these schemes like so she wasn't sitting there sort of you know um this kind of singular single kleptocrat sort of like with octopus arms she had this whole um amazing office of highly skilled executives um and fixers and professionals accountants lawyers um both in uzbekistan but also abroad i mean really there was a lot of stuff going on abroad as well um and that's a really critical element so you know and that's the thing you know i think it's one of those things where um when you're looking at criminology um and and you want to do serious work on 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 state crime or corporate crime um you're faced with a very challenging reality and that is that you know um, particularly in, in realms like corruption you know there really isn't um you know a huge amount of data that's publicly available and there aren't authorities who are spending copious amounts of 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 money to try and and investigate and expose and and obviously prosecute these people. I mean, it goes on, and there are some countries that have a better record in this respect than others. But it's it's a drop in the ocean, so you kind of have to to work out, um, you know, very much, um, you know, a methodology. How do you how do you begin to get all this detail? I mean, and and for me, it was not clear. There was no textbook in criminology. So how do you investigate kleptocrats, corrupt people and other state criminals? I mean, we have our methodology books, but nothing that would really give you that kind of framework. So I kind of just began originally um, sort of, um, you know, mixing in at, at investigative journalist conferences and workshops, just sitting in the background, learning how they do their things and, and began to sort of networking also with people who'd worked in uh, policing around organized crime and just saying, like, how do you do your investigation? So I just began to, to really annoy a lot of people who did have the expertise and, and find out what they did. And then, you know, it was one of those things where at first I was like, oh, how do you go about doing this kind of investigative work when there's no real template for it methodologically in our area? Um, you know, so you don't have much scientific credibility, cred credentials to go on. And I, that made me nervous, but I thought, well, you know, here's an opportunity to start to forge through the furnace of experimentation, that kind of methodological armory that will give it credibility. And I think, you know, and that was about then learning things like, you know, okay, you, firstly, you need to develop a nose for when cases, you know, because there are thousands right now i'm working a lot in uzbekistan pop and there are thousands of potential cases you know but you need to have a nose for a case where you're going to get access to the right level of detail and it's got to be a case that obviously fits with real research questions so you need to get a good nose for when a case has, has got some ch some chinks that you can be able to to get access to data and then you need to learn once you know your case, you go, yep, this is a really good case to look at, you know, Karamova, or it might be, um, you know, um, the sons-in-law of the new president of Uzbekistan, or it might be a politician in, in, in Papua New Guinea. You go, okay, well, how do, I've got to learn how to map um, all their interests, you know, what companies do they own? Um, who are they? Who are they um, connected to? What are, the, what are the kind of schemes they might be involved in? Um, and that involves then learning how to get information on companies how to you know you need to uh, learn and and once you get into former soviet spaces obviously accessing company information is quite tricky um you need to learn how to um read company documents you need to be able to read um you know to me uh, um you know you go and get a company extract or a share transfer document and you know five years ago i would have just looked at them like a, a sort of um you know a pretty um sedate document now I see them like a, you know, a murder scene. You know, there, you, you, there are all these little signs all over them. Sometimes, I mean, it's the stupidest little things that sometimes you'll find that a kleptocrat um, does that opens them up to 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 exposure. Like, for example, they go on to the point of getting some nominee shareholder to hide their um, interest in the firm, but then go and use their email address as the contact point. You know, um, so you know something like that. Um, or um, they, they, you know, in another case I was looking at recently, they used the UAE vehicle, which you can't get the company extract for. You only, you, so you couldn't find out who was behind that UAE holding vehicle, but they went to the effort of um, trademarking all their company's intellectual property. And then on the, on the intellectual um, 
property register. Their name was used. I own all the IP that this company. So they went to all that trouble of like masking their involvement. Um, but then, you know, just was, was slipped up and being a bit clumsy, not thinking anyone would, would, would check the IP register. Um, so you need to be able to start to learn how to access all these different points of information. Um, you need to know, that, you know, you know, you need to start to know how to access court documents. Um, you need to know, you know, you need to learn where all, you know, you need to know all the different government um, points of information you can access, which is different in every country. So in somewhere like Uzbekistan, IP register is a great way sometimes of finding information. In somewhere like Papua New Guinea, where a lot of the scams around land, you can go down, you can actually you have legal power to go down to the Department of Lands and ask for um, land titles. Um, and to see um, uh, copies of them. And that can provide you really critical information. Then you've got to learn kind of how to, to get sources. So, you know, usually once you start to map a case, you find all the people who are involved. And then you start to think out who out of these people might be more inclined to speak with me and provide information. Um, often it's really great if, which often happens in, in nefarious activity where a key manager um, ends up getting shafted in some horrific way and they then have a lot of wounds that they want to heal by and they heal them by giving you a lot of documents which is great um, then you so you've got to learn how to sort of manage um, you know human human sources and that also comes with certain ethical implications as well that you've got to kind of manage as well and then um, you've got to, you know you can find all sorts of other techniques like to do with data scraping so you know if you can data scrape an entire company archive and then you, you can say, you can find out a lot more about someone's network of connections and if you're just having to put one entry at a time. So you find other methods like that. And then you start to pull together, uh, then you need ways of computing the information because uh, you know a case like Karam over that involves um, dozens of companies, hundreds of uh, dozens of bank accounts, hundreds of people. And so I would use um, Multico case file, which is a free um, uh, software, which allows you to create um, digraphs and it's quite uh, flexible. You can create them however you want to create them. So all these network graphs. Um, I use timeline software um, where you can begin to, to map on a, a timeline transactions um, because your brain just simply cannot compute all at once um, these different layers of networks, transactions, and as they change over time. And this allows you to not think it, but see it because it's all there on a, on a visual template. Um, you need to use spreadsheets again for the same reason and then and then once you start it's interesting once you start to to build these techniques you start to become be able to get information that's quite um important and you can be able to start publishing it and then once you start to publish it particularly if you're able to do it through media platforms people start to become aware and that's actually a critical point methodologically because once people are aware that if you get information you're good at processing it and turning it into something that's that's valuable and in the public interest you start to then get whistleblowers coming to you and people or you know it's not just whistleblowers people who've been burned and and that can be really um you know valuable too um and that's that's kind of and and then it's like you know and the the, the trick then is how do you take this because i think you know, when I go to a lot of the conferences, and this is not a criticism of journalists, because, you know, I love my investigative journalists, um, you know, they're kind of do amazing work. But often it's kind of like, it, it's all a bit like a, a magicians, they come in and they kind of throw a smoke ball and they show you this amazing work they've done. And then they kind of go off in a puff of mystery. And, you know, obviously for us as academics, it's like, you know, we've got to be able to put these techniques into a systematic framework that can then be shared. And, 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 and I think that's the next challenge is to turn these techniques and methods into transferable form skill sets that can then, so we can grow our capacity to do more work like this. Great, thank you. It's really interesting about the, 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 the work that goes into it and the, the nuts and bolts and software and everything that you need to, to put together because it's just the, the sheer amounts of information just seems daunting from the start. Um, the, we, we, you're, we've been talking about Uzbekistan and Papua New Guinea as well. These are two jurisdictions that you look at. Um, but I just wanted to touch on jurisdictions like the UK, Switzerland, Australia, which are connected in some way uh, to this, these schemes. Could you tell us a bit about the role that these kinds of jurisdictions play? Um, and, and, and you know what's different about them? Why do they play that role? Why are they needed externally like that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, th I think it's it's really interesting because, you know, um, take somewhere like Papua New Guinea, um, 
you know, it's 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 a Melanesian island, um, eight nine million population. Um, it's it's sort of widely regarded by any of the sort of standard indexes as being you know wildly um, corrupt, and and like you know, and there the the sort of image that's of corruption is kind of the classic um, politician big man who's kind of using you know um, his his power and his uh, you know and he's following and and to kind of personally gratify himself with all sorts of inappropriate deals and and so very much the kind of image in some of like Papua New Guinea when you think of of of, of um you know corruption it's 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 corruption of a if I can put it of a, of a with a brown face you know it's a it's it's whereas like when I began doing this work I was like going these that's a white face man it's not this is not um there is so I mean firstly because it's like well un, in colonial times I suppose that if you wanted to just come in to a, a colony and extract and loot its wealth of natural resources it was easy enough but of course once they got um once once countries got ostensible independence and sovereignty you know it wasn't quite the open door and so but you know you, like if you can come into Papua New Guinea and 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 you can get access to a very rare um finite material like oil or gas or 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 um mega thick forests with valuable and rare timber um you know obviously you have two things you want to be able to get them and your competitor not to get them and also you want to get them without having to pay much in the way of ground rent or monopoly rent for for the for the fact that you know they have a rare a rare geo you know um you know geometry what a, a rare you know wealth of natural resources that other countries don't have or at least in that and and so you know, it was it was really apparent from day one that actually a lot of the people who were 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 stirring the pot of corruption were actually um, coming in from abroad. Not it was Australians. Australians play a huge role in in stoking corruption in Papua New Guinea. Um, I mean, they're they're massive, um, and and to an extent Malaysia as well. Malaysian uh, business people, particularly in the forestry sector, and increasingly we're seeing China. Um, you know, but the irony being that, of course, China does a, a corrupt transaction and you'll see as politicians in Australia sort of gasp with horror and clutch their pearls as if, uh, meanwhile, Australians have been doing the same thing on hyperdrive for, for decades. Um, and I think so that's the first role. They're actually in there, not simply as a service providers, but they're actually there. Um, stoking corruption because it gives them certain economic advantages it gives them a competitive advantage over over rivals and it also means they can access very valuable natural resources without paying any monopoly rents or paying less monopoly rents than they otherwise um would 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 have to pay um and then you know then you see them also uh, you know whenever you do find those very corrupt politicians who absolutely do cash in on their portfolios so you know um you know right from the prime minister down to various ministers who have you know obviously if you're a minister um uh, each portfolio has different opportunities and obviously if your portfolio involves natural resources that's a very lucrative opportunity um and you find then again that you know who do they work through they work through uh, largely australian lawyers um you know and then and there was a very famous um well like famous locally um uh, expose that um sbs did with um uh gosh i'm forgetting that there was one of the ngos um where they uh, recorded um a, a, an australian lawyer very prominent australian law, lawyer sort of giving um advice to a a british investor on how to layer a bribe so that it didn't come to the attention of international authorities because the British investor wanted to access something lucrative in Papua New Guinea. And so they're told to take it offshore and to keep it small and piecemeal, um, nothing too big. Um, and it was sort of, um, you know, the advice was if you're going to do something, you know, illegal or criminal, not that I'm advising you to do that, this is how you would do it. Um, you know, so, um, but you then find um, they, 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 the lawyers are helping them 
um, set up the infrastructure for corrupt deals. They're then helping them, uh, they're using their escrow accounts to get the money out of the country. Um, and then you find the money, so in addition to providing these, you then find a lot of the companies that the corrupt politicians run are run by Australian executives um, in some of like Papua New Guinea. Um, you, you know, you, even in Uzbekistan, which has, uh, uh, you know, you, you still find similarly there, you'll find a lot of foreign fixers who are standing around, even foreign exam, particularly from the United States um, in, in, um, in Uzbekistan. So there's, um, and then you find they obviously, um, someone like Papua New Guinea, they want to park their, their not hard earned money, the opposite of hard earned money in somewhere um, where they can safe, you know, in houses. So they go to Queensland where they can splash the cash on, on real estate. They can, um, you know, send their kids to the top private schools. Um, you know, and um, and 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 that's so that's another role that these places play. And Australia, you know, if you have to go by record, Australia does nothing to stop it. Um, you know, it has no problem with a modest civil servant coming in, sending their kids to two to private schools with thirty thousand dollar a year fees, living in properties worth you know millions of dollars, um, et cetera, et cetera. So so that there's that. Then obviously you got you get the foreign jurisdictions are also in addition to providing they're also providing the sort of um, reputation laundering services so you know you can go to these into into these jurisdictions and and access people who do PR for you who will you know you can invest in I don't know um, I mean that's kind of the, the funny thing now we have that that's this. Uh, um, European um, Super League, you know, and this kind of idea that, oh my God, this is corrupting our sport. And it's like, dude, have you looked at some of the people who own the football clubs? I mean, not, you know, um, so, so, you know, you can own football clubs, you can, you can, you can um, contribute new wings to various universities in uh, Oxford and Cambridge um, or other. And, and so, you know, that's, that's the other kind of key conduit as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. I think that's given us, you know, an amazing insight into the mechanics and background to, to doing this important, um, chronically under-researched area. Um, but I want to open it up now to the to the audience with for, for a QA. Um, before I do that, I just want to thank um Bilchanara and our law events team for putting together this event. And I'm going to pass over to Angela Sherwood, uh, Dr. Angela Sherwood, who is kind of uh, collecting some of the questions that have come up in the chat for us. Um, and we'll relay them on to you now. And then uh, once we've gone through them, uh, Angela or myself may have another question or two and, and we'll open it up to uh, in the audience. But please do stick any questions you have now uh, in the chat box. Uh, and Angela, what have we got so far? So we have two questions so far. Um, the first question um, is, could um, Professor Laslett talk a little bit about his thoughts on the link between corruption and organized crime, if there is any, and the role of law enforcement authorities in this relationship? Um, and there's a follow on question here that says, can um, Professor Laslett suggest um, two papers um, that researches kind of this topic, um, basically this link between corruption and organized crime and, and also the role of um, law enforcement authorities? Um, and then we have another question um, that's on um, databases and it asks, do you use any of the big commercial PEP slash CDD databases, uh, Refinitiv, et cetera, and what's your take on them? And a third question, and then we'll sort of pass it back to you, Chris. Um, are you working on COVID related corruption in the UK or elsewhere? There's much to do here. Cool. Um, that's great. So I'll go, I'll, I'll go through those in, in order. I mean, I think it's interesting, um, you know, you take something um, like um, Uzbekistan and you, if you frame a question of, of the relationship between organised crime, um, law enforcement or security services, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, my, fir my first 
thing there would be, you know, it'd be hard to tell the difference um, between them, you know, because um, in some of those Uzbekistan, the the security services would be involved in a lot of organised crime. Um, they would have had a historic relationship, for example, with um, drug trafficking, um, as as one instance. Um, and and I mean, you know, the the security services in Uzbekistan. Um, were more or less operating for a long time as a, um, a, racket, a racketeering organization. That's what they were. I mean, it, it, they're not a security service in the sense of like, uh, you know, they're, 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 yes, they maintain, um, they, they're there to ensure the continued authoritarian rule of the, the government of Uzbekistan, but they're um, there and, and they maintain um, an extraordinary surveillance apparatus, not and and supported, I might add, by a whole range of like outside um, organizations and and companies. I know, for example, there's been really good exposés done on Israeli tech companies helping um, the the the, the organized, which which is organized crime in in reality, which is their security services monitor um, um, the national population, um, and then these security services, in effect. Um, operate um you know rackets they they control they control uh or they have control oil and gas they've controlled um freight and logistics um and they've um they've also they had a horrific reputation um for for um going in and shaking down business people just saying you know if, if someone got rich who wasn't connected um, they, 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 it was just a matter of time in Uzbekistan when the security service would knock on your door and start um, shaking you down for money. And when I say shaking you down for money, it usually meant you had a quick trip to the local prison where you were tortured and, and told that you're going to have a 15 year prison sentence unless you paid up a certain amount of money. Um, and, and that and that happened frequently. And then if you paid up the money, they'd take your business anyway. And, and if you were a, a, a foreign investor, they'd They'd, they'd put you on a plane and the best you could hope for is you get home with nothing after maybe having 20, $30 million of assets in the country. Um, so, so they operated as organized crime and therefore they also had a very good, they have a good relationship with organized crime. Um, you know, so in, in Uzbekistan, there would be a number of high profile organized crime figures who would be closely connected to senior politicians who would be closely connected to oligarchs and they would all be in a carefully managed set of relationships where they all are there to bank money and they're all there to try and 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 um you know uh, manage the the national security and the national economy in a way that means that that they're able to do this and of course the, you know what people like me end up doing is we sit around and wait for um peace accords between these different groups to to break every now and then and that's when you usually get um compromat as they call it there you know information being leaked on on different groups so it's it's just it's so organized crime is just a part of the it's just you can't differentiate it almost becomes differentiating between organized crime and and is is is, is and and differentiating that from the security service is really difficult um so um in terms of the, the databases, um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I was originally sort of looking at kind of drawing on um, a lot of these um, ser services. I mean, there's a kind of, they're quite, some of them could be quite expensive, um, but then I, I think part of it was, um, you know, I talked to colleagues who'd, who'd worked and in these regions and they said, you know, I think they're better for, for you know certain places but places like uzbekistan where there is just not much information available to to extract i they're not known as being terribly useful so i haven't used them um, and i create my own databases um where you know you just day by day accumulate information and you you deposit in your your database and then you start to develop your own um data set like that so i haven't i haven't gone to that and in a, in a way i kind of don't want to go down that route because i think our aim should be trying you know to try and develop um open source um um databases that are available to the public um and and i think you know that's certainly been one of my aims so i for both for uzbekistan and Papua new guinea we've developed 
um, you know, a whole range of open source databases that would provide the public with, I would say, better information than some of the commercially available databases. So in Papua New Guinea, our database is used by the central bank. It's anti-money laundering unit. They use that um, as their go-to point um, because, you know, it, it's got better quality information and it's more systematic. Um, and, and, you know, um, so yeah, no, so the short is I haven't. Um, though I'd certainly be interested to know if anyone sort of um, has found that they actually are really great and we're and you're merely missing a trick if you if you don't use them. Um, and on COVID, you know, um, you know, of course, in terms of COVID-related corruption, um, you know, I think the 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 breaks were taken off everywhere in the world once once. Um, and I think COVID in a way has really alerted people to just how embedded the sort of corruption is with there any everywhere, you know, certainly in Papua New Guinea and, and, and Uzbekistan, once you had um, COVID, you had the uh, both countries um, take huge loans from the IMF um, and uh, ADB and, 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 and then they started spending that on all sorts of goods and services um, that were not accounted for. And I mean, it's a pretty standard, I mean, in Uzbekistan pumping is pretty standard. If you can get a crisis like that or anything, you just, it's, it's, it's easy, it's easy money for looting. You get, you get hundreds of millions of dollars of capital from um, international banks. It then goes into your economy. You set up sham goods and services that it can be spent on, which are just fake goods and services so that you can justify the money being transferred from one bank account to another. And you may deliver something. I mean, you know, um, or you may not. Um, it doesn't really matter because there's no one really checking anyway whether you're delivering the goods as 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 was um, invoiced, um, and and then the money shoots off um, usually through various the aid of various lawyers, and we're seeing the same kind of dynamics um, in the UK um, as well. And I think that's a really important point. I think there's a really there's a risk that we have, and I would be the first to admit that when you do research and you focus on regions like Papua New Guinea and Uzbekistan, you begin to create a unjustified view that reinforces existing perceptions that, that, that indexes give that corruption is a problem for the global south. Um, the, the sort of global south to, um, you know, um, to the global south to kind of better its ways when in fact you know what what COVID-19 has shown is that 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 corruption is 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 rife within the global north and I think there is there are really important differences um, that need to be taken to account um, so you know we've had um, the the obviously a lot of interest in in COVID-19 procurement and how you got basically have government ministers recommending their mates or family members who then wind up getting $100 million contracts for a service they actually have very little experience in, in doing. And, you know, um, and the interesting thing is in somewhere like Uzbekistan, that would be a massive story. Like that would stop people and people were talking about it for weeks. Whereas like, you know, uh, you would think it would be even bigger story in the UK and it has been, big, but not, not, not traffic stopping perhaps. And then you have more recently, Greensill, uh, the Greensill Capital story, where basically, you know, you had this um, uh, Aussie uh, um, banker who set up his own um, um, uh, firm and they began um, uh, did doing supply chain finance and they managed to, and he managed to kind of get choice NHS contracts without tender and, and then uh, 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 Dave, Dave, Dave Cameron was the one who was sort of involved in a few civil servants. And then, um, you know, these, these, um, these people then go and work, work for, for, you know, Dave Cameron in particular. Um, and, and, you know, the interesting thing there is, I mean, that, that if you, if you took that to Papua New Guinea or Uzbekistan, they'd be like, oh my God, that is so corrupt and nefarious. And my God, like these people are going to be like imprisoned, right? And you go, oh no, it's legal. It's probably not done being done that's actually criminal or illegal here. And that's, I think, the thing is that we've got systems in the global north that are much better at kind of, you know, um, at, at actually creating, you know, allowing the sort of gaming of, 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 of markets and commerce 
um, and it's completely legal. I mean, one really simple analogy would be um, somewhere like Uzbekistan, you, you, taxation, you don't want to pay tax if you're an uh, uh, industrial company because every, ta- every um, you know, um, buck you give to reproducing the, 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 the nation is one buck less in your own bank account. So, you know, if you can solicit bribes to the right people, you can get tax exemptions for 10 years, you know, you don't pay any tax, you just keep that going forever. So you never pay tax. You know, whereas in the UK, we just set up, uh, uh, we get some very savvy accountants um, and, and people to go and write taxation laws that mean that people can very legally set up their affairs through trusts and other vehicles in overseas offshore locations, British overseas territories, and not pay a cent of tax and never break the law. Uh, they're still doing the same thing. They're both, um, they're, 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 they're super wealthy people looking to avoid um, paying any money to reproduce national infrastructure and natural resources. Um, but one, they're doing it through much more clearly illicit means. And the other way they're doing it through legal means, but both are corrupt, you know, both would, would be, and that's where I think goes back to that original question of what's corruption, you know? Um, and I think if we use laws as our basis for defining what corruption is, then we end up just sort of giving certain jurisdictions that are marked by sort of very malevolent um, relationships and forms of manipulation, a free pass, because they're really good at making that legal. And, and other jurisdictions where they use different methods, which are much more transparently illegal, we kind of focus on them when actually the problem is very similar. Thanks so much. Um, we have two more questions here. One of them is, how do you deal with corporate filings in foreign languages? And the second one is, why has corruption pers- persisted despite national laws like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the US um, and also treaties such as the OS, uh, OECD anti-bribery, um, especially in areas like the energy sector? Yeah, so so I think that, the, I mean, I kind of like, the, the first question I like because it kind of allows me to indulge in really nerdy things, um, you know, which I think is it's maybe a, a comment to, 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 to all researchers. I mean, you go like somewhere like Uzbekistan, who on earth would go in and start doing investigations in Uzbekistan when they don't know Uzbek and they don't know Russian? Um, and they uh, and, you know, it's like, well, yeah, it's impossible to do. Um, and actually, you know what, the, 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 the things have changed so much now that you can you can actually it's fine um google translate for example i can read you know 100 page presidential decrees um in uzbekistan using google translate and and it's and it's and it's pretty accurate i mean i, I for example i just finished a report that that had huge lot, lots and lots of quotes in it all taken from google translate and then i got a professional translator to come in and to to check it and they're like actually it's most of us pretty good it wouldn't change too much so the 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 automation of translation services means that you can begin to access um, um all sorts of documents without um, it, it being prohibited by language barriers. And I think even then, even when documents are scanned, you can, there are great services now where they OCR, you know, free online, they OCR it. And then they, and even if it's in Cyrillic, it can it then convert into English. So you can even take a document that is not machine readable and make it machine readable and, and convert it. So I don't think there's any barrier anymore to, um, you know, doing investigations in these regions, even if the, the language barrier isn't there. And, and, and where I found it really useful is that um, in someone like Uzbekistan, the people I'd collaborate with, they're absolute dynamos when it comes to source management. Like they have sources everywhere, which I don't have because I don't have the language skills or the intimacy on the ground to manage people resources. So they do that. And what they're not as, as and what I bring is that, you know, understanding, being able to, to, to understand the, how the information systems work and how to find information that is buried somewhere deep in some database and, and, and finding how to extract that. So, um, yeah, so, so it's, it, anything's possible in this day and age, in short. Um, and I think, um, you know, in terms of, you know, yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's been a whole raft of um, laws um, that, I mean, I, you know, take, I think that's the anti-bribery laws is a, is a really great example, um, you know, and it's and it's simple enough in that um, in every case that I've I've looked at where there are significant levels of U.S. currency transactions and there's bribery involved, 
like everyone involved in that organization is going, all right, Dan, we're going to have to worry a little bit about what's going to happen here um, with in, in case of DOJ suddenly tweak onto what we're doing. And so, you know, every major corporation has is fully cognizant of their legal responsibilities and they are, and that's just something to be managed, but it's not something to stop you doing it. Like you're going to make money and you're going to do this. So like, you're not going to stop doing it. You're just like, well, how do we manage this risk? So that risk of, 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 um, you know, of, of prosecution is just that it's a risk. It's like, well, there's a risk that this will happen, but the risks are still pretty small compared to the volume of bribery that's going on globally. So, you know, your chances of getting caught are infinitesimally small. And then what happens if you do get caught? What are the risks then? Well, you know, ask, ask, um, you know, companies who, you know, you go onto the, um, you know, DOG website and look at all the companies that have been um, the subject of multiple deferred prosecution agreements. Um, and, 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 you know, you ask, ask companies like, um, you know, um, HSBC, ask companies like um, Credit Suisse, you know, they're, they're there. Um, and, and obviously, you know, it doesn't stop, stop them. It, 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 it's, a, it's a factor that they take into account. It's a risk. Um, and, and obviously in this instances where I've seen it firsthand in terms of records, it's a risk to be managed. I mean, I'll give you one example I remember from Coca-Cola, which I mentioned before, you know, there in that instance, you know, there was a memo by one of their finance directors who said, geez, guys, um, getting into, entering into a joint venture partner with this really shady looking anonymous offshore vehicle is really high risk and it might come back to bite us on the, on the ass. But like, let's do it, you know, <laughs> like, it's just, it's not like you don't, you know, if you've got a chance to get into a lucrative market and there's no competitors um, or, or immediate competitors, like you do it and then you manage the risk. And if the risk transpires and it turns out that behind that anonymous vehicle was, um, I don't know, the daughter of the president, then you deal with that eventuality when it arrives, you know, you, you, you manage it, you go and speak to DOJ you know, you, 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 you forge an agreement with them. So, you know, regulation just becomes another factor to, to manage. And I remember talking to um, a, 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 a former head of compliance of a major uh, international uh, telecommunications company who was, um, uh, well, I won't give too much details, I'll reveal, it might reveal who they are if you looked it up, but they that their former job was in a, in a secret service. So they're pretty, uh, um, and they were like, like he said, like, you know, and not that I'm, I'm advocating, you know, incarceration, but they said, like, no one's taking this stuff seriously because no one's going to prison. You're never going to get, you know, executives to take anything seriously if when it's just a monetary fine. Um, and not, and I don't think actually if you started to imprison people, it would actually necessarily resolve the problem. Um, you know, I think that, 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 that it would just be up in the ante in the risk management and, and, and the steps taken. So, I mean, I think the problem comes down to the fact that it's just that these issues are, um, you know, when power, power pulls in small hands and there's a lot of money to be made, um, people are always going to, to take advantage of the opportunities that they, 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 they provide. And it's only if we manage to engineer a social system that decentralizes power, decentralizes wealth, and creates much more transparency and, and, and participation from, from workers, from, from the public, that you're probably going to negate that. But that's kind of like, you know, we're talking there, uh, you know, revolutionary transformation, the existing order, which doesn't seem to be on the cards quite at the moment. Thanks, Chris, um, especially with that last optimistic <laughs> assessment. Um, does anyone else have any other uh, questions uh, for, for Chris? I mean, Chris, maybe you could uh, elaborate a little bit uh, on your last point, um, because you, you know, you've talked about the limitations of the law and controlling corruption, and you've also talked about the limitations of, um, you know, the criminal justice system in general. Where do you see um, corruption being resisted, and what kinds of sites of resistance and responses do you think have been, you know, not necessarily effective, but kind of have been building momentum to kind of. Um, challenge corruption and challenge the way that corruption is, is normalized and embedded within uh, the kind of everyday system and, and workings of government. Yeah, well, I mean, I'd give, I'd give um, a couple 
of, of examples, you know, I think, um, you know, firstly, um, you know, take something like, I, I mean, first, I think I, I would, yeah, I would tend to be skeptical of the ability when corruption and countering corruption becomes something that is um, managed by a sort of fairly opaque technocratical organization, like a, you know, a government Department of Justice, a regulatory authority, um, I would I would be skeptical of that being a lasting solution. Not necessarily because anyone inside those organisations don't have the zeal and the desire, but they're never going to get the resources or the political backing to be able to do it at the scale that would be required to seriously make a dent in the problem. And that's where I think the most exciting initiatives are those that actually are about um, engaging the public, engaging mass participation in and, and opening up the opportunity for, for participation um, from, from civil society. And, you know, so, you know, I think that's where transparency, even though I, I, I kind of bristle against when I hear the word transparency, because it's often, mis you know, governments say, oh, we're transparency, transparency, but actually what they mean is giving out lots of meaningless information and ensuring nothing good gets released. But I think, you know, in terms of um, the work that's been done to 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 make um, you know companies more transparent. You know, in the UK, there's been a lot of uh, of work by Global Witness and um, you know Transparency International, whole range of organisations around opening up companies' house, ma making their register more accessible, um, getting a, a register of beneficial owners, um, getting a um, and and starting to crack down on pernicious products like Scottish limited partnerships. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a cat and mouse game, right? We're, we're in a, a game, right? Where, um, where, and the more of the more scope we can make for them to, to make a mistake, the better. So the more that they have to keep hiding their tracks because there's more places they have to hide their tracks, the more chance they make a mistake and the more chance that we can get them. And we have more chance of getting them if there are more people involved in looking um, so I think, you know, that's that's one really important thing. I think another example would be something like in the UK, again, the Tax Justice Network, where, um, you know, it's been really impressive, not, not, a, not a single handed job, but they have taken something like offshore secrecy and offshore tax avoidance slash tax evasion and pulled it onto the center stage of public interest. And then that's put pressure on what was seeming like the end of history when it came to taxation, where all governments just said, you have to drop tax to basically zero, because if you don't, you lose um, your, your competitive edge. Um, and, and now governments are feeling a lot of public pressure um, and, and they're having to try now and agree, to, you know, taxation regimes that mean that the likes of both, you know, big multinationals and also the super elite, um, you know, who stand behind them um, uh, are not able to escape um, uh, uh, their, their tax obligations. Um, you know, so I think those kinds of movements are really important. Um, and I think the more hands you get involved, um, uh, the better. And that's why, again, you know, even in places like Uzbekistan and Papua New Guinea, you know, I think you're if you're going to be reliant on um, the the authorities to to do something, you'll be um, waiting a long time. Whereas, you know, if you can start to build popular mobilization, you can begin to build tools and mechanisms that allow more people to get involved. I think there's more place also for us in the, in the academic sector because um, let's look at journalism today. You know, there's less and less resources to investigate. Um, because investigations often require long-term resource. You, don't, you can't be pumping out an article every day if you're working on a complex investigation, and it's only um, really a small number of organisations that can do it, whereas in the university, we're built for long-term obligations. You know, that's what our whole life is about, is, is long-burn research. Um, and I think, you know, if criminology was able to, to actually harness its interests and its and its resources and begin to direct it, you know, more and more towards this work, which I've always argued for, you know, that's what the state crime initiative was about, was saying so much of criminology is devoted towards, you know, I'm not saying it's not it's uncritically, but towards street crime. And a lot of that's been really important because, you know, street crime involves abuses of power and all sorts of things. But, you know, by, you know, jolly, if we had everyone, a lot more criminologists developing a interrogative apparatus 
for actually exposing this stuff, um, you know, we could actually have quite a, a, a meaningful impact, like the, like the Tax Justice Network has and Global Witness has and people like that. Thanks. Um, does anyone else have any other questions before we wrap up? I think I'll then maybe turn it back to you, Tom, to say a few words and close. Yes, thank you very much. Um, really fascinating talk, Chris, and given us a lot to think about and also giving us uh, um, impetus to, to change our way of thinking about things as well. I, I was looking at, a, at the treat we were given today, which was the text exchange between Dyson and Boris Johnson, uh, where <laughs> Boris Johnson responds that he's the, the lord of public money and don't worry about it. Uh, and the response from the government is, well, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing illegal going on here, uh, as if that's the answer. Uh, and, and, and as we've discussed, and as you've shown, that isn't the answer, actually, that just because there's nothing illegal about it, uh, which I, I, I suspect there probably is something illegal about it, but just because there wasn't, doesn't mean we're not talking about corruption. And so there's a, there's, we need to bridge that gap there between how people understand corruption uh, and respond to it. Um, and, and the tools that they have to respond to it based on that understanding as well. I think that's uh, going to be something that's definitely um, a big issue. It looks like it's, gained, it's it's snowballing in the UK at the moment. We'll see what happens. We've, we've been through this before. Um, well, no, but no, no, also, the just to, but just sorry, to just to connect it. Yeah, go on, go for it. I was just going to say, and I mean, I, th I think you, you're right there. And, and I think, you know, um, and, you know, one of the points we didn't touch on, but, you know, is a really important one is that, you know, um, whenever you're trying to do this kind of work, there is also um, a, a, a whole host of, pay, you know, lawyers and so who are trying to threaten you. And, and I've got, you know, I've had um, threats from lawyers. I've had death threats. I've had all sorts of, 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 um, of, of different tactics employed. Um, and, and certainly what I find almost um, sort of cathartic now is I, I often begin pieces by saying, no one's saying anyone's done anything illegal criminal here. I'm just gonna let you, I'm just gonna lay out the facts what happened here. And, and it's outrageous, it is audacious, it is totally against the public interest and none of it is illegal and none of it's criminal. So if you're a, if you're a, a sort of, um, you know, a, a libel lawyer, nothing to look at here because I'm not accusing your client of anything criminal, anything illegal. I'm just saying that as, a, as, a, as an investigator, as a researcher, it is completely outrageous and against the public interest. And why, and why, 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 and why does it mean that just because something is, is legal that we should all be, so, oh, well, then, then okay then, you know, um, that, that's totally fine, move on. You know, let the public decide whether they think um, Dave's relationship with Greensill was totally cool and, you know, or they might, uh, you know, form a very different view. And I think it's, it, I think we kind of liberate ourselves a bit by not being wedded to the idea that, you know, we have to kind of characterize something as illegal or criminal because actually that can create a lot of headaches, uh, not least getting it published. Um, and sometimes it's better just to say, nah, nah, who knows? Let, I mean, because when you define something as illegal or criminal, that's really uh, a technical characterization, isn't it? It's something that a lawyer can, or and a court can come to a conclusion about, and that's fine. That's what they're there to do. And it's not our role to decide whether something's illegal or criminal. Um, and, and in that sense, we can, we can just present information saying it's completely outrageous and hugely problematic, and it involves whole hands of abuse of power, but we're not necessarily, you know, if it will be up to some authority or person to come in there and, and, and prove it's illegal or criminal, or, or if that's what they want to do. But, we're, you know, and I think that's important, you know, and it will liberate us a lot if we get over that hump. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Angela for organizing this event uh, and putting it together. And I want to thank Gulch, uh, and who's always working hard in the background to make sure that they run smoothly, these events. Thank you all for coming and for your excellent questions, which has stimulated some great discussion with Chris. Uh, and finally, thank you to you, Chris, uh, for, for giving us a, a real kind of honest and intimate insight into the work you do. Uh, and we we're, we're look forward to 
much more of it to come in the future and we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, and if anyone wants to keep an eye on um, events coming from the International State Crime Initiative, just have a look at our Twitter account at State Crime where we post um, the Eventbrite registration pages for when they're upcoming. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Thank you again for coming. Um, and I look forward to continuing this conversation uh, in the near future. Oh, thanks very much, Tom. Thanks. Thanks everyone for the questions.